seek His face in prayer as we consider His worthiness in the Psalms. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much that You are worthy of all the praises that we bring. Lord, we are, of all people, without hope in this world if Christ has not been raised, but He has been raised. And we thank You for this glorious Gospel. We thank You that we have reason to rejoice in the Lord this morning. Please help us to see from the words of this psalm that it is good and it is fitting that Your people would rejoice in You. Fill our hearts with joy this morning. And help us to reflect it to the world that they too might come and see, that they might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing they might have life in His name. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Well, just this past week I was watching a video. There was an American orchestra that was touring in Italy, and they were playing in an open square with a large crowd of gathered people. Then they had played most of their concert. They were on the encore. And everybody had been really excited and joyful about how the concert had gone. And so in this encore, the audience was actually clapping enthusiastically to the rhythm of the song with this orchestra as it played. Even though they didn't speak the same language, you had the Italians and you had the Americans with English and Italian, the orchestra and the audience was able to rejoice together through this jubilant music and clapping. Because there are appropriate times to rejoice, aren't there? You know, life is filled with both joy and sorrow. And we see this reflected in the Psalms. We've been through many Psalms of sorrow, but here we come to Psalm 47. And it's an invitation to all the world, really, to join in jubilant clapping. And and why is the world to clap in this song of praise? Because the music isn't just joyful, but it's joyful for a reason. The reason is that God is the King of the universe. So this psalm calls us to rejoice that the Lord is King, just as we sang this morning as we opened up this service. And even as we dig into the psalm, we'll see that there are three reasons why we can rejoice that the Lord is King, and we can invite the nations to rejoice that the Lord is King. Notice first that we rejoice the Lord is King because He loves us. So the psalm opens up in Psalm 47, verse 1, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. You know, from the dusty plains of Africa to the frozen Siberia tundra to the winding waters of the Amazon to the beautiful coastal cliffs of the British Isles to the exotic outback of Australia to the forested wilderness of the Canadian North to the massive expanse of the Rocky Mountains to the most remote island in the South Atlantic. God calls all people, to praise Him. And why is it that God can call all the nations to praise Him? Because of His universal reign. It demands universal reverence. You see the reason in verse 2. It says, For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great King over all the earth. The Psalms uses several names of God purposefully. And in this Psalm, we see in verse 1, it starts with the name Elohim, which emphasizes God as the powerful creator. Then here in verse 2, you see the name Lord. Probably in your translation, it's in all capital letters, L-O-R-D. And that is the name Yahweh, which emphasizes God's special covenant relationship with His people Israel. It's this creative God who is also Yahweh, His covenant Lord with His people Israel, who is the Lord Most High, verse 2 says. Last week in Psalm 46, we saw this same title, Most High, to point to God's loftiness and His exalted status as the ruler over the world. And now, here in Psalm 47, it picks up that title and it's going to carry it to its logical conclusion. Because God is a great king over all the earth, he is to be feared. He's your creator. He's your Lord. He's your sovereign. 
You know, in ancient times, kings had absolute sovereignty over the land. We have our division of powers, right, in America with the executive branch and the legislative branch and the judicial branch. A king was all of those branches combined into one. There was no division of power. So when you approached a king, it was with a very real amount of fear and trembling in his presence. We see in the story of Esther as Queen Esther could only approach the king if he extended the scepter to her. It was a dangerous thing to step in uninvited, but she knows she, she needs to speak to him for the sake of saving the people of Israel. And so she goes in order to save the lives of the people at the risk of her own life, even though she hasn't been invited for over a month into the king's presence. We read in the story, on the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. Now when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight. Then he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. You know, if the kings of the earth demand such reverence, how much more should the creator of the universe, the king of all things, demand our reverence and be feared, as verse 2 says. For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. The people of Israel did have earthly kings who ruled them, but they knew that over those earthly kings was the king of heaven, the king of all who ruled over them through their king. And so you notice in the psalm, though there is this healthy, reverent fear, mingled with it is joy, elation, satisfaction. All people are called to clap. They're they're called to shout with loud songs of joy. So how is it that this joy can be mingled with this reverent fear? What causes that? Well, when we realize that the Lord is not just the king of the universe, he doesn't just have all this power and ability to judge us, but that he is a God of love. He's a good king. And he shows his love in the people who he has chosen. The focus of this psalm suddenly narrows. I mean, it's calling all people to praise him and and it tells them that he's the sovereign of the universe. But now it's going to focus on specifically his people. Here in verses 3 to 4, we learn that God's sovereign choice displays his sovereign love. The way God works with his people shows how much he loves us. The nations of the earth are invited to come and see how God had led his people into the promised land. He took them out of Egypt and led them into the promised land and gave it to them. So we notice the conquest in verse 3. It says, he subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. There's the conquest. That God worked for his people. But then notice the land that he gave them because of it in verse 4. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. That word heritage is a specific word that refers to hereditary property. God had assigned to the Israelites by tribe and by clan specific plots of land that were to remain their own permanently. And so this land given by God is called something. You notice it says he chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob. They loved this land. Jacob is a reference to the nation of Israel. Then it was an evidence to the people of Israel that God loved them. This is what he had given to them. This is how he had led them. And there was no specific reason or good in the people of Israel themselves for why God gave them the land. Instead, it was because God was good. Think about it. As we celebrate the 4th of July this week, and you enjoy the freedoms that God has given you, and we know there's lots of debates and problems that are raging in our nation right now, but just think of the bare fact that God allowed you to be born into this country. God allowed you to hear the gospel God gave you so much. He's given me so much. And it evidences, it displays his love for his people. So he reminds the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 7. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. They were set apart to him. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. That raises the question, why? Why? Why would he choose them? Verse 7, it is not because you were more in number 
than any other people that the Lord set His love on you and shows you. For you are the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that He swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You see, God's loving choice of his people and his gift to them of the land was meant to highlight his love. Every time the United States of America goes through election cycle, people go to the polls and uh, the, the, the booths and they vote. They decide who they want to be president and by casting that vote. And some people, when they find out the result of the election, rejoice! And then some people don't, right? <laughs> Might perhaps be quite the opposite. You see, we're, we're thankful, we're happy when someone who we appreciate or we admire and respect is in office and who rules over the land, but, but when they're not, we're also equally disappointed discouraged we want someone good ruling over us that's the way it goes so proverbs 29 2 puts it this way when the righteous increase the people rejoice but when the wicked rule the people groan and here in psalm 47 all the nations of the earth earth are invited to rejoice because the lord is king and he's shown his love on his people in how he took care of Israel. He's demonstrated his loving character and his saving nature in them. He led them out of bondage into a good land, not because of anything good in them, but because he is faithful to what he's promised and he is steadfast in his love. He chose Israel to show us what he's like. This is who God is. And just as God chose Israel and blessed Israel, so he has chosen and blessed every believer in Jesus Christ. So Ephesians chapter 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And of course, the doctrine of election is a difficult topic for some believers to handle, and it causes quite a bit of debate among people. But what I'd like to point us to this morning is the reason God brings this up in the first place. Why is it mentioned here in this psalm? The reason it's mentioned is to point us to God's character. He chose Israel because he's a God of love. And it's a summons to all people to come and rejoice in the king of the universe who's most high, who must be feared, yes, and revered, but he must also be appreciated and worshipped because he is worthy in his love, in his love. And he shows it in the people whom he has chosen. You know, just in the last few weeks, we've seen headlines coming out of Russia where Vladimir Putin was faced with a threatening test to his rule the president of Russia had one of his own military leaders. You give me Prigozhin. Tom had a time pronouncing names. Now it's my turn, right? Ordered his troops to start marching towards Moscow. And really it came out that his plan was to capture other military leaders because he wasn't happy with how the war was going and how people were treating him. You know, it's not a good sign when a, one of your own military leaders marches on your capital and starts trying to capture other military leaders, Right? That doesn't reflect very well on Putin. And of course, uh, he was pretty upset about it. And then in like one day of negotiation, suddenly, you know, Prigozhin is ousted. He's exiled and he's handing over his military weapons. But the damage is done to Putin's name and his character, right? He looks weak. Looks like he can't handle the country. It's not as unified and powerful as it once seemed because of the rebellion of the ranks and the casting out of a commander who used to serve food at Putin's table. But when it comes to God, the king of the universe, the way he relates to his people is quite different. They rebelled a lot, didn't they? They were foolish, often going astray. And yet because of God's promise to them and his covenant, and because God is a God of love, he disciplined them, he chastened them, but he never gave up on them. 
and he demonstrated who he was even in the midst of his people's rebellion. It didn't threaten him. It displayed his character, his righteousness, his justice, his love all at once. And if you do not know this good and loving and just God, I invite you with the psalmist to come to Jesus Christ and rejoice in God's saving love. He's the creator of the universe, so he owns the rights to your life. More than that, we've offended him by our sin, by going astray, by violating his commands, and we need forgiveness in Jesus Christ. When we confess our sins, here's the good news. Because God is a God of love and steadfast forgiveness, He forgives, and when we fail, He remains faithful. So Titus 3.5 says, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. And if you do believe in Jesus, if you're a believer today, this psalm is an encouragement to you. It's calling you today to rejoice in Jesus and what God has done because He loves you. I mean, you may have failed in big ways this week, but the reality is if you come, confess your sin, and return to your Savior, He forgives you, He loves you, and He's already made a way for you to be forgiven. He's just and righteous because His Son sacrificed His own body on the cross that you might be forgiven. What happens is when we rejoice in our God who loves and forgives us, it's a testimony to a watching world. We invite the nations to see And rejoice that this Lord is King. So rejoice, the Lord is King. And we rejoice because He's the God of love. That's the first reason this psalm invited all the earth to see God's love for His people. And all the earth should see God's love for His people in us, too. Now He's going to show the nations how God's love is expressed towards His people in one particular way. And that's in his presence. We can rejoice the Lord is king, not only because he loves us, but because he is with us. And immediately this makes me think of Psalm 46. Last week we saw, this was the main theme of Psalm 46, that God is with his people. It talked about how there is that Gihon spring in Jerusalem that flowed through the pool of Siloam, and it was a continual reminder of God's continual presence sustaining his people. And now... This psalm picks up that same theme of God's presence and tells us that we should sing of His special presence with His people. Notice verse 5. It says, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Now that might not mean a whole lot to you when you first read it on the surface, but what you find is actually that last word is an interesting word in that verse. That word trumpet is literally the word shofar. You know what a shofar is? I think I got a picture of it up there. You know, it's a curved horn of an animal, like a ram, that was used as a horn or a trumpet in festivals or battles to summon large groups of people. And what's so interesting about this verse is that it's almost the exact same phrase that appears in 2 Samuel chapter 6. There we read, So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn, the shofar, same word. In other words, this psalm seems to be referring to that moment that Tom read, that's why I had him read those hard names, was because it, ha- it tells us about when the people of Israel brought up the ark of the covenant to rest in the tabernacle in Jerusalem. And as we've seen so far in the book of Psalms, here, book 2, there's this cluster of Psalms of the sons of Korah. They were the ones who led the worship in the temple. They're the chief musicians. And if you look up the title of this psalm, it says it's a psalm of the sons of Korah. So really, what we seem to be seeing is a section where there's this this section of the life of David where the kingdom is settling and people are worshiping God in the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant is brought up And it signified God's presence with His people. It was a special moment. They're literally celebrating God's presence coming up with His people. The Ark of the Covenant was supposed to reside there on Jerusalem. And so all the nations are invited to look on and see, literally, that God loves His people because He dwells with them. He's with them. He had given them a good land. He had given them a good king. 
And so in verse 6, they say, sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. Because God loves them. He's with them. And that's literally the word psalm. The word sing praises. So they're saying psalm to God. Psalm to God in very rapid succession. And the way these words are encrafted increases the intensity of the psalm. It, it fills it with enthusiasm. We often do this in the way that we sing. For example, why don't you pull out your hymnal right now? I'm having some trouble with my mic, so I'm going to adjust here. But look at hymn 43 in your hymnals. should be in the seat back pocket in front of you. Just make sure. Number 43, we sang this this morning. Rejoice, the Lord is King. And if you go down um, to the last line, or the last uh, system of music there, where it starts with lift up your heart, going to the last one, lift up your voice, rejoice again. I say rejoice. You know, that line really just says one thing, doesn't it? It really is basically saying sing with joy. That's all it means. So why do you say it so many different ways? I mean, Charles Wesley could have just done that. He could have just said, sing with joy, sing with joy, sing with joy. Done. But then the song probably wouldn't be in our hymnals. Because that's not very fun to sing, is it? And it doesn't really picture singing with joy very well. It's not poetic enough. Instead, he pictures singing as lifting our hearts, lifting our voices to God. And more than that, he repeats words and phrases that rhyme with each other, like voice and rejoice. And then he interjects and he kind of stumbles over himself. He says, again I say, rejoice. That's a lot better than sing with joy, sing with joy, sing with joy. And it's the same way here in verse 6 of Psalm 47. It's written to sound joyful. And Hebrew poetry doesn't typically rhyme, but listen just to the sound of this. Listen to how this sounds. It says, Zamru Elohim Zamru. Zamru Lem Lakenu Zamru. They're singing this enthusiastically as the words flow off the tongue and heighten the, the enthusiasm. It's written for praise. And it would have been marvelous to hear this song sung with its original tune, whatever it was, with people clapping as they proceeded and the sound of the shofar horns blowing in the background. Then that, Here's the point then. It's not just that the people of Israel are celebrating. They should do that, yes. It's that they are so beautiful and attractive in their worship that they're inviting all the nations to join in. They're happy about it. And sing of God's presence, not only over them, but over all people. Notice this in verse 7. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. Because of God's love for His people, because of how God rules over His people, they are now using that as an invitation to all the nations to come and believe in this God. And when they do, you'll notice that last phrase in verse 7 says, sing praises with a psalm. The funny thing is that this word psalm actually is the word uh, mazar, or maskil, sorry. And that's usually used to refer to some kind of word of wisdom. Something that provides instruction. It's intended to teach us something. So really what they're doing is they're inviting all the nations to come and join in a song that teaches truth about God. This isn't an empty song full of emotionalism that just stirs people up. It's got truth and it has a point. In the New Testament, Paul says that we should do this, the same thing, in a different way. He says, I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. What's he saying? He's saying that he can have joyful emotions in his heart or whatever appropriate emotion might be attached to what he's singing, but he should never disconnect his emotions from the truth. It's really the truth that grounds the emotions and drives them. He's communicating something that's intelligible so people can hear, understand, and be edified. Perhaps you've flown on an airplane before and the pilot gets onto the intercom and says, thank you for flying with. Looks like fair weather today and temperature. 
fasten your seat belts and now thank you click you're like well, i hope that wasn't important because i have no clue what he just said right unintelligible noise doesn't help you it doesn't profit the hearer and in this psalm the nations are invited to sing a song of wisdom that communicates clear truth about who god is there's no static in this song it's laid out plainly and clearly so all people can see, which gives us a couple of applications. One of them is that we should not just come to church and sing for sentimental reasons, just to stir up emotions or to make us feel better. Every time we sing, our emotions are shaped by the truth that we're singing. That's what guides our emotions. The second thing is that we have a clear message to tell to the nations. Our king reigns, and through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we don't send mixed signals. There are a lot of confusing signals and messages that people receive in the world around us, don't they? Our message should not be unclear, but rather they should understand and see and behold the gospel of Jesus Christ in the way we speak and in the way that we live our lives. We're called to make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that God has commanded us. And the gospel is where this psalm is steadily heading. It started with a summons to the nations to rejoice that the Lord is King, and then it shows them in His people how He loves us, and so they can rejoice in that same saving, loving God. And ultimately, it's going to show us how God is going to reign over all people through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So notice finally, we should rejoice the Lord is King because He reigns over all. Verse 8 reiterates this point. Notice it. It says, God reigns over the nations. God sits on His holy throne. Notice that in addition to focusing on God's reign, there is now an important piece of information that drives this psalm forward, and it's God's holiness. Why is God's holiness brought up here? Does that seem random to you? Well, the reality is, is that God's holiness actually establishes His reign. This is what legitimizes it. We often think of holiness in terms of moral uprightness, right? A person who's holy doesn't lie, or they don't steal, or they don't give in to lust. But really, being holy is more than that. It includes moral holiness, but it's bigger than that. When we speak of something being holy, we talk of it as being set apart or unique, separate from other things. So one of the classic examples of that is in the temple worship. God set apart certain utensils and certain vessels to be used in the temple worship. And they're only to be used in the temple for those specific tasks like a bowl that was set aside to carry incense into the holy place. That's what it was for, and you weren't supposed to do anything else with it. And when we consider God and His holiness, we realize that He is separate from us in many ways. Here in this psalm, He's in a category all to Himself because He's the King of the universe. He's the creator of the universe so he has a right to rule over us there's no one else in that category god is in a category all to himself because of his unfailing love for his people do any of us love like that no none of us can love perfectly like god does so he's holy in his love and his creative power there's many other ways that he's holy he's eternal he has no beginning and no end His justice is firm and fixed, righteous like a mighty range of mountains. It doesn't move. It's not affected by the opinions or the faces of whoever he's dealing with. You may have heard of a term in sports. If you haven't, I'll introduce it to you now. It's called GOAT. It's just an abbreviation for the greatest of all time. Whenever you're talking about a certain sport, this debate comes up. Who's the GOAT of whatever sport? So is it Michael Jordan or LeBron James in basketball? Who's the greatest athlete of all time in that sport? And really, who gets, uh, but I guess the question is, what gets those players into that debate in the first place? I mean, they're among elite athletes. If you're in the NBA, you're an elite basketball player. That already sets you apart. But these players, because of the way they've played, the championships they've won, their skill in the court consistently over time, it sets them in another category, above even the elite. They're like the elite of the elite. Why? Because of their track record, how they perform. 
And what we see here in this psalm is that God has put himself in a class all by itself because of the way that he rules as king. There's no debate here. There's no one who even comes close to him. So all people should rejoice that the Lord is king because he deserves it. We sang this morning, worthy of worship, worthy of praise. Why did we sing that? Because he is. There's no one like our God. So he proves through his holiness his reign. And in a special way, we see this in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The final verse of this psalm clinches the point by showing us that his universal reign is exalted in the gospel. Read with me verse 9. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. Here really what the psalmist is envisioning is a day when all the rulers of the nations gather and submit underneath God's reign just as his own people were called to submit. To his reign. It's a call to the world to submit. But what this verse does is it thrusts us forward to look to that ultimate fulfillment when people from many nations and tribes and tongues gather under God's throne because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God had promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And here it is. And in you... All the families of the earth shall be blessed. So how did that happen? How were all the nations blessed in Abraham? Well, when we get to the New Testament, we see that in Romans chapter 4, Abraham is called the father of all who believe, who believe in the gospel. And then Galatians chapter 3 says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. You see, through Abraham and the nation that God brought, Israel, God brought his Messiah, Jesus Christ, And those who place their faith in Jesus Christ are blessed along with Abraham who received this promise so long ago by faith. So when the psalm says, the princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham, we see part of that fulfillment in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, not all believe, do they? This doesn't mean that everybody's going to be children of Abraham because not all have faith. They're not all saved. And that's why we need to exalt God and show that He is worthy of praise because people need to hear the gospel. They need to be pointed to Jesus Christ and how else are they going to hear it? How else are they going to see the glory of the gospel unless we rejoice that our Lord is King? You know, this truth is illustrated in a powerful story during World War II. One author put it this way, On February 3rd, 1943, a U.S. ship carrying 902 servicemen, merchant seamen, and civilian workers was struck by a German U-boat torpedo in the cold Atlantic. Through the pandemonium, according to those present, four army chaplains brought hope in despair and light in darkness. Quickly and quietly, the four chaplains spread out among the soldiers. There they tried to calm the frightened, tend the wounded, and guide the disoriented toward safety. Witnesses of that terrible night remember hearing the four men offer prayers for the dying and encouragement for those who would live, says Wyatt R. Fox, the son of one of the chaplains. One witness, Private William B. Bednar, found himself floating in oil-smeared water surrounded by dead bodies and debris. I could hear men crying, pleading, praying, Bednar recalls. I could also hear the chaplains preaching courage, Their voices were the only thing that kept me going. By this time, most of the men were topside, and the chaplains opened a storage locker and began distributing life jackets. It was then that engineer Grady Clark witnessed an astonishing sight. When there were no more life jackets in the storage room, the chaplains removed theirs and gave them to four frightened young men. It was the finest thing I have seen or hope to see this side of heaven, said John Ladd, another survivor who saw the chaplain's selfless act. 
As the ship went down, survivors in nearby rafts could see the four chaplains, arms linked and braced against the slanting deck. Their voices could also be heard offering prayers. Of the 902 men aboard that boat, 672 died, leaving 230 survivors. When the news reached American shores, the nation was stunned by the magnitude of the tragedy and the heroic conduct of the four chaplains. The Distinguished Service Cross and Purple Heart were awarded posthumously December 19, 1944 to the next of kin, and a one-time only posthumous special medal for hero heroism was authorized by Congress and awarded by President Eisenhower on January 18, 1961. The special medal was intended to have the same weight and importance as the Medal of Honor. You know, when people witness a great act of courage, we instinctively want to honor it and admire it. Even though those men died, the impulse was to award and celebrate their bravery of sacrifice even after their deaths. And as great as that sacrifice was, it only faintly reflects the exaltation and the honor that God deserves for sending his son Jesus to die for your sin and for my sin. We were enemies with God, at war with him, lost in our sins. He had no obligation to save any of us. I mean, it'd be the equivalent of these four army chaplains taking off their life preservers and giving it to the very Germans who had torpedoed their boat, their enemies. God's love for us is so radical that Romans 5 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And it's this glorious story, the good news of the gospel that exalts God's holiness. His love is unlike anything we can comprehend. And he rules and reigns over all. And he uses that reign to show us what he's like and to call people to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus tells us that the cross was the way he would draw people to himself. So John 12 says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And that's what he did. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, for everyone here in this room, God has drawn us to himself and shown us who he is through the good news of the gospel. So this psalm concludes in verse 9 with this phrase, For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. What do the shields of the earth have to do with this? Well, shields are for protection, right? What God is saying is that through this glorious gospel, he provides salvation and protection for all people who come to him in Jesus Christ. This creator God can save you. Therefore, he gets the glory. You see, we've gathered together today to worship God. We've come to exalt him, and we did it around the gospel, even in our service this morning. And the reason he is highly exalted is because he has saved us. You know, Hebrews 10 tells us that we should put a premium on gathered worship. It says we should not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And what I want us to notice as we close our service this morning is that this is not some kind of legalistic reasoning, like you save yourself because you go to church. Rather, it's that we gather, God, gather to exalt God because of the gospel. We're praising him and worshiping him because he is like no one else. He set himself apart in his love and that grace motivates us to gather and worship him. And you know what the trickle-down effect is? The trickle-down effect is that other people see us gathering and worshiping God for how good he is and it draws them to him as well. So think about your children, parents. When you worship God in church, they see that. They see your love for God and your love for his people. You're calling them to come worship God together. Your example matters. Think about your neighbors 
who watch you every single Sunday as you get out and you drive to church. It's not that they should see you and say, oh, they're a good Christian, check the box. It's that they should see your life and realize that you love God because of the gospel. It's opportunity for you to be a witness to the nations. This isn't legalism. This is worship. That's why we rejoice that the Lord is King. He loves us. He is with us. And He reigns over all. So our mission in this age is to continue, continually faithfully exalting God for what He has done in the Gospel. And when Jesus returns, it will be clear the Lord is King. And we rejoice in that fact today. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for the good news of the Gospel that displays Your holiness and shows us how unlike us You are, God, in Your perfections. I pray, please help us to worship you and rejoice in you because of who you are. But we also pray, God, if there are people in our lives who do not know Jesus Christ, I pray that you would help our worship of you to be a witness to a watching world of how good you are. God, people can tell from our lives as we rejoice or as we just kind of look at church as a thing to check a box with, Lord, that whether or not we really are satisfied in you. So I pray that we would behold who you are, that we'd rejoice that the Lord is King because you love us, because you are with us, and because you are exalted and reign over the earth. We thank you for this joyful psalm. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to continue to rejoice that the Lord is King this week. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.